Acesta este Curious Nine Podcast, prezentat de ING. Hello and welcome to a new edition of the Curious Ryan podcast brought to you by ING. I am Vlad Andriescu and today we're going to talk on video and also audio um, about the relation between fintechs and banks. Maybe two years ago we said it was a complicated relationship, but nowadays fintechs and banks are working together and are trying to find something common and something useful for the people um, who are using those products. So today we have a special guest. It's um, His name is Olivier Guillaumont. Um, hello, Olivier, first. Hello, Vlad. Thank you for having me. So uh, just to um, let the people know something, some, some uh, things about your activities, um, you joined uh, ING Group as Global Head of Regulatory Change, overseeing global implementations. Uh, and in 2018, you switched to the Innovation Office. And nowadays, um, since 2020, uh, you are overseeing the incubation and acceleration um, activities at the ING Labs with one clear purpose, creating maximum impact for ING and its clients, um, also scouting for uh, new and very interesting fintechs. So. Olivier, just just to uh, start it, um, you uh, joined ING, as I said, as a head of regulatory change. So what attracted you in the first place in, in joining the organization? Wow, it's, uh, so I think it started a long time ago because before joining ING, I worked uh, 10 years for Accenture, a big consulting company, right? And then I uh, created mm-hmm. my own company. And after that, I, I, I joined ING. So ING used to be my client when I was a consultant at Accenture, but also at the time I was, I do remember, I was living in, in France. Um, and then I, it was a time that ING Direct was launched globally. And I remember that I received those orange letters telling me that, you know, this new bank was coming with this new, completely new proposition of uh, no branch and a higher saving rate. And I was uh, a student at the time, or, you know, I was just starting my career. and. I was quite sensitive to those higher saving rates. Uh, I was quite impressed by, you know, this complete change of uh, of business model. So then I thought, okay, IG, interesting. And with this lion, what is this? Uh, and, and years later, when working in the corporate world, you know, I, I, IG being my client, I always had a special, you know, connection with IG. So then when, when I asked myself after my exit of the, the startup I created, what, what what is it that I want to do? And... I thought, well, you know, working for a bank and actually for ING is something I would like to to try. So that's how basically uh, I got into uh, into ING. Um, nowadays, you are um, overseeing the scouting, um, the selection, and partnering between, as I said, fintechs uh, and ING units. And I want to um, talk to you about how this process works. Um, and let's take the listeners or, or the viewers, if, if you are uh, seeing us on, on video, in this journey of discovering good um, fintechs to partner with ING. Yes, so, you know, it's a process that we, I think we have started maybe six years ago, and we learned a lot along the way. I mean, <laughs> from both sides, I think if I am a fintech or a ING, you know, what does that mean? So what we have done along the years is a few things. So first... What we do is to have a very important alignment internally with our ING businesses, right? Because we are doing it for ING's clients. So it starts with our value, our strategy. So what we have done is divided, let's say, our FinTech team in aligning across business units. So we have dedication. We are very close to the business units. So we understand which, what each business unit wants to achieve. What are the goals? What are the pain points, the opportunity that we see? And that's why it starts with a very clear idea of where we want to improve or where we want to add or where we want to accelerate, um, which then define the framework in which we are open for partnership, right? Um, and this is where we, we do, let's say, specific scouting. One thing that we do is together with the business heads, we define what are the criteria for success. Uh, and there are many across the different verticals, right? So what about the team? So when we look into a fintech, you know, we look into the team because the team is very important. We look into the product, obviously. We look into um, 
the scalability of the, the fintech. Earlier on, we were looking at young startup. I think over the years, we realized that uh, for, for ING to be successful and for the partnership to be successful, we need to engage with more mature startups or more scale-ups type of people. And for us, what is important criteria is to, to uh, that each startup uh, or scale-up in this case has to have at least one uh, implementation with a regulated company because then it will, it will help us uh, tremendously uh, along the way. So we apply this criteria and then we go from a long list to a short list, right? And from that short list, then we do what we call rapid proof concepts in a couple of weeks on our infrastructure. And then we go to one selection, which is you know jointly agreed with the business and obviously with the FinTech. We also jointly agree on the success criteria and then we do a, a pilot for a limited number of clients or a limited number of countries. And depending on the outcome, then we go hopefully to commercial contract, right? And that's how uh, it goes. And what, what is important there, uh, because ING, we are a regulated company, so also the risk framework is important. So very early on, we start with the risk assessment, which can go, you know, which can be quite a legacy process. But what we did, we adapted our risk appetite to make sure that we don't bird, burden, let's say, the fintech into uh, thousands and thousands of pages. But in the end, it's a bit more continuous process that we start early on across the, 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 the pilot. And then when we are ready to go, we can actually in parallel finish that exercise and then go live, basically, right? And actually, the go live is the start. So we don't stop there. What we do is then monitor the impact of that partnership and we try to scale it globally across countries, across business units. Um, and we keep on working on the partnership, right? Because obviously the partnership is a lengthy process. It's something I want to do for years to come and not uh, the one-off. So it's really a, say, a multi-year uh, process that starts, let's say, from clear upfront agreement on success criteria and the use case that we want to solve up until hopefully the most scalable partnership possible. Um, thank you very much for for uh, for the detailed um, um, journey path uh, in in working with um, the fintechs. And I read that, um, and I and I think that this number uh, is uh, way higher right now. Uh, I read that you scouted for two thousand fintechs. So going a bit back in in your um, uh, journey. Um, are you you mentioned that uh, you are looking for um, specific business needs um, and you talk with teams from from inside ing um, is this scouting based on on that talk with um, with the teams uh, from ing or are you just looking for for interesting fintechs from all the markets and how do you choose the markets because you mentioned that you try to scale it globally but sometimes you work um, country to country with with some fintech. Yes, so actually, that, that, I think there are two possibilities, right? So either there is a defined scouting request, so there is a business that knows what they want and they know where they want it. So it could be Angie Romania who wants to do something, could be, you know, could be Angie Wasser Banking, could be any, anywhere in the organization. So in this case, we, you know, we support the business in finding the right partner, right? So in this case, it's very defined, very clear. In anything that we do, at ING in general, you know, we, will, we, we really want to go global, let's say local for global, as we call it. So we can start in a specific unit or a specific country, but always with the, the, in mind to have the possibility to scale beyond that, right? So uh, that's very important to us and for ING at large. Um, what, you know, um, then um, what we do is that we cause, you know, so we, we cannot scout the world. So we have different specific you know, priorities that we, that we agree with the businesses, right? So that's why it starts indeed. So we don't scout just for the sake of scouting. In the end, it's about the p and impact and the customer satisfaction, right? Um, that, we, that, we look at, that we're doing this, right? So it starts with indeed the business priority and the strategy. However, uh, the team that we have, and we have a global team. So we have a team in Amsterdam, but we have people all over the world participating to this scouting exercise. That's why we, we, uh, we can reach those numbers of thousands of fintech scouting because it's a global effort. And a lot of people are proactively reaching out to us, right? But that, what we do is that when we see specific trends or when we see specific opportunities, then we go and proactively go to the business to say, hey, we understand the strategy today is this, but actually we see something else coming strongly and very important for our clients. Maybe we want to refresh our strategy or capture that opportunity, right? So it's really a dialogue where we have a clear starting point and a clear priority 
to proactively scout, but at the same time, there is a space to let's say adjust based on how the world is going and you know the, the, the shifting priorities that we see in the market. So I am curious that because you talked about the process, because you you, you uh, said me, how how do you look for for the fintechs? What is the lever that you are looking for? Because you mentioned an interesting thing that you are trying to uh, start with beta tests just to um, do not put some some great pressure on a on a small fintech. So what is the lever that you are looking for? And maybe how do you help those fintechs in scaling if you need to? Look, in the end, it takes two to tango, right? So indeed, what we do, but also also for ourselves, right? Internally, we want to make sure that we understand uh, and we and we do that also with the end customer in mind. And we do that, we validate as we go. So we have a specific methodology to make sure that we don't go to the market without having all the pre-validation, right? In terms of value that we bring to our customers, right? So that's something that we do in, in a controlled way, I should say. When it works in one country, uh, and as I just mentioned, one of the criteria to select a fintech is the scalability possibility of that product. So we know we can technically do it. We also know that the company is mature enough to go with us in a different unit or a different countries. And, and, we, and we do that together, right? So maybe a good example will be, uh, just to make it very concrete, right? In um, We have partnered with a Swedish company called Mina, which provide a subscription management value proposition, right? So we have test we have tested it. So we have scouted it via the fintech team, tested it uh, via a pilot in our Angela Brussels, which is a, an acceleration lab that we have in Brussels, where we do paid pilot with fintechs, right? Then we realized that for the Belgium uh, market, that was actually it was validated with our customers, very happy with this proposition. So we decided we are going live now actually, as we speak in Belgium with Mina, but we already know that we have in mind that we want to scale this proposition outside of uh, Belgium. Why? Because we know that they are already live in the Nordics. They, are, they have demonstrated they can be live in three countries, which is you know, quite special for fintech, right? So for us, it makes it very attractive because then we know that we can scale it you know, in other countries in Europe, but also outside of Europe. So we have a clear together jointly scaling plan because we cannot dictate how a company like Mina will roll out globally. But obviously, if as ING we say, well, we are willing to go to this market together with you, then it gives obviously a lot of incentive for an organization like Mina to say, okay, to be willing to make that investment uh, to go to that country. And we could even participate to the funding round, for instance, right? So there are multiple ways on how we can jointly uh, scale across, uh, across countries. So, um, because you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Mina, um, and it's it's a very interesting example. Can you give us some more examples uh, from around the markets you are um, present with with ING of fintechs and products that you are um, proposing basically to the to the customer? And afterwards, we're gonna go to how they are basically pitched to to your customers. Right. Uh, maybe a few examples, right? Because we have uh, a lot of partnerships. Yeah. I think I will maybe give a few examples, which are, you know, and you don't see, as a user, you don't see all of them because some of them are in the background, still extremely important and they bring a lot of value, but not client facing, you'll argue. So maybe on the, they said the client facing one, where well, Mina is clearly uh, one, as you just mentioned. Um, and some of them we are partnering, but some of them we are creating ourselves. So we'll come back to that later on, maybe when you want to discuss uh, what we do in ING Labs. But so focusing specifically on the partnerships, so Mina, I just mentioned about it. I think another one which I think is interesting is something called Scalable Capital in Germany, which looks into providing robo-advisor type of services. So that's we, really, let's say, a very uh, easy and attractive way of uh, investment. So providing, you know, retail investments. Uh, so that is something that we are partnering with ING Germany, so between ING Germany and Scalable Capital. Uh, and that's, you know, the results were, were amazing, where in, in three months' time we reached half a billion asset under management, right? And the idea is, you know, uh, we have integrated the Scalable Capital proposition as a referral into the ING channel, but I'm always having this loop back. So as an ING customer, it's very easy for me to take full benefit from the, what the FinTech, in this case, Scalable Capital has to offer. But I, I don't need to, to leave my ING, uh, let's say, uh, channel to see the result of my investment. 
Uh, so, but you know, it's another it's another example of uh, of um, I think interesting uh, an interesting fintech which is really client facing. Another one staying in Germany will be more for the SME side, so small medium enterprise, where we announced a couple of uh, months ago a partnership, I think a, a unique partnership with Amazon, whereby if I am a merchant and I want to sell my services and my product on Amazon and I need financing, I can automatically receive my loans via ING Germany, and that. I mean, the reason why we can do this is because we bought a fintech in Germany called Lendico, who is bringing to ING this technical capability of having this, uh, let's say, seamless, real-time lending proposition for SME uh, on the Amazon platform. So those are, I think, maybe just three examples of both for retail and for SME of, I think, very attractive proposition for our, for our customers. In the background, so maybe something that we don't see as a user, but extremely important to you know for for our clients and for ourselves, is the automation part and the way we took care of of, of data privacy, right? And for that, we have a very interesting partner with a company called Eigen Technology, who basically uh, provides NLP, so natural language processing technology, to do to automate repapering. So as a bank, we have you know millions of customers, and our regulations imposed to have you know, a lot of papers <laughs> and a lot of contracts, but then we want to make sure that we uh, don't need to have, you know, SaaS of people to read everything and to retype everything. So we have an engine that actually automatically um, uh, scan across all documentation is able to intelligently, you know, pick up the right wording and then automatically can process information. And that is extremely helpful for a lot of, let's say, reentry uh, projects, a lot of repapering exercise that we have to do. And that is something which, uh, where the machine can go, you know, a, a way better job than any analyst that we can hire uh, at scale. Um, and and we we'll, and we just we also invest in this company. Huh? So it's a, it's a good example of we have seen the impact, and the impact for us is, is millions of euro impact. Uh, so we want to make sure that we also help the scaling of this partnership via investing into the company, right? And we did the same, uh, which will be announced I think next week with a company called Exate. We looks into how to take care of data privacy. And for us, it's very important as a bank to make sure that we are on top of the game when it comes to managing data privacy. And for that, we also see a lot of interesting fintech in the market helping us doing just that, to be really at the top uh, of our game when it comes to uh, managing data of our customers. So you mentioned uh, um, how do you, you mentioned these examples and also that in some companies, in some startups, um, you are looking also for um, investing in them uh, or maybe buying. Um, how do you um, analyze this these basically more possibilities? Uh, you can just work with a startup who is mature enough um, and has also investment. You maybe put uh, put a stake in it um, from from the venture side of ING or maybe buying it um, at full. What are the criteria um, for for these uh, decisions you are making? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and there is actually a fourth way, but we come back to where <laughs> we create our own our own fintechs, right, in the labs. But look for us, you know, as I mentioned, the partnership is the starting point, right? Uh, in terms of uh, there should be an opportunity, there should be a clear opportunity that we see that we agree with our our businesses, a uh, sizable opportunity. Which is in line with the impact that we want to create, right? And for our customers and for and for ING, so that's where it starts. Um, and then you know, the investment that we can make is always linked to the strategic angle, right? So we don't make an investment just for the return. We we make strategic investment. Um, and then depending on the level of a strategic fit, uh, this is what derives uh, whether we just do a commercial contract or whether we do a commercial contract and an investment, or we do. More than that, uh, which we basically can go into an M&A opportunity, right? So it's really about the level of strategic fit and the size of the impact for ING and how quickly we want to go. So there is no, obviously, a, a automated tree, <laughs> decision tree for this, but I would say it starts with the opportunity to partner, the size of the opportunity, how quickly we want to go, and how special that is, right? So if it's a commodity, I'll give you a few examples, right? If it's if we feel that it's a technology which is already a community and we don't gain any advantage by buying it, then why should we do that, right? In this case, you want to partner and you want to go quickly and benefit from the, the great capability to go faster to the market, right? If we think that there is more than that, so it's fully strategic 
but you know the size of the opportunity but it's an early stage company uh, we are not sure if uh, you know we, so we want to take advantage of being early in the process this is where we want to combine let's say commercial partnership and investment normally we will we will first look into a commercial partnership if the results are promising then we will potentially invest uh, in the Surrey A or Surrey B, let's say earlier stage, also to be able to help the company to grow, I was just mentioned, while at the same time having the possibility to benefit from the, the success of the company, right? And then when basically it's all of it, it's very strategic, a huge opportunity, and it's so special that we want to keep it for ourselves. <laughs> this is where the m &A, uh, opportunity uh, might come into play, right? Uh, so that's a bit of the, the thinking process, uh, if you will. Also, in in um, the last few episodes of of the Curious Ryan uh, podcast, we talked um, about these two choices uh, for um, for a big company of developing itself a product um, or finding. Um, already startups already existed, uh, what what which are on the market right now, and partnering or buying them. So you mentioned the NGO apps, and you mentioned what you are a bit what you are building there. So uh, let's develop a bit on on ING apps, um, um, basically role inside the organization, and what kind of um, things can be developed from there. Yeah, so we have four labs, right, at ING, four ING labs. So one in Amsterdam, one in Singapore, one in London and Brussels. So basically, the ING lab has, has two uh, missions, if you will. One is to accelerate fintech partnerships. And that's what we do in London, specifically on the rec tech business, but, but also in Brussels, in ING lab Brussels, where we have a well-recognized uh, acceleration program, uh, where Mina was coming from, for instance, and many more. So very, you know, it's a very impressive vehicle that we have built there to be able to really accelerate where more than 50% of the time we actually translate into commercial contracts. So it's a very, you know, important uh, vehicle for us and for, uh, I would say, the fintech ecosystem. And then Amsterdam and Singapore, what we do is to basically create new businesses where we incubate our own ideas uh, to create new businesses that we haven't found anywhere else. So when there is an opportunity, and we're looking into disruptive uh, opportunities, and so not incremental innovation, but really something very new. Uh, if you follow the, you know, the McKinsey Horizon model, that's what we call at least Horizon 2 and, or and Horizon 3. So there should be a lot of newness uh, into the IDs. Um, and it's risky by design. So that's why NG Lab is there, is to de-risk, to explore, to experiment, to discover. And if, uh, if we think that indeed there is a real potential, then we scale, right? So um, uh, today we have about 30 to 35 actually initiative in NG Labs, which are, you know, in the scanning, uh, in the funnel, as we call it. And some of them are already scaled out. So when they go out, depending on the strategic fit for the same story, right? So we are looking at what is the best scaling direction for the initiative to be successful. It could be when ING is so important for the success, it could be what we call a spin-in, meaning that we develop a product or a business, but then we, it becomes a, a new business of ING, and that's great. Or we could say, in order for the initiative to be successful, we need to, we can't do it on our own, and it's important to partner with someone else, and then we spin out, either with a VC uh, type of play or by creating consortia with other financial institutions or other partners, right? And lately, and, and, and lastly, if we think it's so, you know, important for ING, but that still needs uh, to be growing outside of ING, uh, but we want to keep full control, that becomes what we call a, a scale-up, mm -hmm. where we keep within ING, but we fully own it. So if you look into, uh, and we have experiences and, and I would say proof point in, in all those directions. And obviously at any moment in time, we can stop uh, or we can sell, right? So that, you know, and actually, that's probably uh, what with the majority will be stopped because, you know, when we experiment, you know, we also have to be very critical to where we are. But for those who manage to go through the funnels, you know, there is a great future, right? And we want to make sure that they are in the right position to be successful. So maybe to give you a few examples uh, that might be known into market. So mm -hmm. one will be Yolt, for instance, which is a both a B2C and a B2B uh, 
propositions whereby it's a money management app in a financial health space where basically we provide aggregation of banking account but on top of that you know a lot of additional added value services in terms of insight but also in terms of bringing uh, the user to a very interesting partners across all type of financial services what is important with result is is that it's banking agnostic so even though it's owned by ing it you know there is no preference <laughs> uh, it's open to everyone and, and banking from a banking perspective completely agnostic right so when we look into uh, into yield as ing we see with open banking we believe that one of the potential future will be to be you know across banking and that's for us our bets that's why we are invested, you know, in Yolt, and we believe that it's something which is very interesting to continue to to be part of, right? So today is 1.6 million users, right? So it's already significant across multiple countries. So for us, that's an interest. It was, you know, started in ING Lab, uh, and it went through the entire funnel, and now it's a really a scale up uh, controlled by ING. Another example is the same type of ID, but for the corporate side, uh, initiative that we called Cobase, which also was originated within ING Labs. And the idea is to do also aggregation account, but for corporates. So if I am a treasurer of a large mid corps or large corporates, most often I have to deal with multiple banks. And today I have to go to all my portals one by one <laughs> and try to, to, to do my liquidity forecasts and my cash flow management uh, and my hedging, which is you know, complicated. So the promise of, of Corbe is also on the back of open banking was to say, okay, why don't we create a single platform where we can meant for treasurer where we can aggregate all my banking accounts my banking relationship and i can manage my daily uh my daily business from one place right uh adding you know adding a fixed hedging cash flow management uh, cash pooling etc etc payment of course mm -hmm. um and there we said okay it's interesting but actually we can't do it only with ing so in this case we said okay it's more you know important and successful to spin out and to welcome other banks to join, you know, the core base adventure, also for them to distribute the product to their corporate clients. So for us, we decided on purpose to say, let's spin out, let's invite other financial institutions because it will make core base successful and then also ING successful as a shareholder, right? So this is what happened, right? Where we welcomed to Nordia and Credit Recall lately into the, uh, into the round of core base. So just to give you that's a spin out opportunity. Um, and we also have developed multiple spin-ins where we created actually new businesses where it was so tight with ING that it didn't make sense to spin out, etc. So then we decided to actually spin it into the ING uh, organization. And maybe last example on this one, because I think it's important, mm -hmm. because the Romanian example is something that we created out of Romania called DealWise, which is basically a platform for shopping and for loyalty, whereby as a user, uh, uh, I can actually get... Uh, personalized uh, daily, let's say, offers to merchants I love, uh, where actually I can, um, I, you know, whatever I spend there, I, I make sure that I get, you know, the best offer on the platform, right? That is something which we see, which is live in Romania, which we want to accelerate by adding even more personalization to it. And we see great response from the market. So we decided to take it globally. So now we want to roll out this Romanian invention to other markets, uh, Belgium, Germany, et cetera. And that's something that we feel as ING Innovation, we want to keep because it's a very important asset to us. And that's something that we want to roll out to all our, let's say, uh, ING countries uh, for the benefit of their uh, both retail users as well as merchant uh, partners, right? So that's, you know, the three examples of mm -hmm. depending on what is the best carrying direction to make uh, the initiative a success. So you mentioned the the fact that um, ING Labs offices in in Amsterdam and in Singapore are are working on these kinds of of product, um, and I'm curious, um, how do these ideas come to to fruition to discussion? Is there a permanent team in those ING Labs that are um, constantly working in thinking about uh, about these new innovations or the, there can be external ideas or maybe ideas from people all around the world from ING who are then put inside the ING Labs and developed a bit more. 
No, it's a good question, and I would say all of the above. So <laughs> I think we are very, you know, pragmatic and also uh, modest in the sense that we don't have the monopoly, monopoly uh, by far of good ideas, right? So <laughs> those good ideas could come from our, you know, uh, from people in the lab, could come from colleagues around the world uh, within the energy, but also from partners, from clients. Uh, so what we what we want to do is to maximize, to be open uh, for those ideas, right? To stimulate, uh, let's say, the conversation around those ideas. The origination of those ideas, right? So, obviously, we well, we have one of the world largest uh, internal what we call boot camp that just we just completed, by the way, where we have thousands of colleagues, you know, bringing their best ideas, where we uh, also commit to us to have at least one or two joining IG labs and really try to make it happen, right? So it's our way to make sure we internalize uh, within ING that innovation is not. Uh, uh, the, the the goal of just a few hundred people, but really the, a, a total game for the energy organization. And at the same time, we also organize, you know, client origi origination days, um, uh, and we make sure that we are always open for good ideas uh, from you know from fintechs. We can be co-creation, so we also are very much open to co-create new product together with a, a fintech or a partner, or together with another corporate. So we have multiple of those different settings. In the end, it's about making sure that we stimulate the origination stay open and having the tools uh, you know, to, to make them very pragmatic, while at the same time making sure that so we have the right, we follow the right step in our methods. You know, with Nigeria, we have developed what we call PACE, which is a method that actually is a very structured way of uh, making sure that we always uh, progress based on validation of hypotheses, right? And that's important, whether it's an idea from ING or from a partner or whoever, it has, we always apply the structured approach uh, to make it, uh, to making sure that we're always solving a real problem, and we're just not doing things that we think our clients want, but actually that we know they want it because they tell us that they want it, right? So that's, I think, uh, uh, a very important success factor criteria to not only, you know, originate the right ideas, but also in the execution, because in the end, the execution will make the difference, right? So you. You mentioned um, earlier um, about some examples of products that you have integrated, which are um, which give basically the customers a more complete idea um, about their money, about their investments. So, in your presentation from uh, GoTech World, uh, the online edition. You said that fintechs play a very important role in financial health. So can you develop more of um, this idea and why fintechs is, are important in, in financial health? Sure, look, financial health, I mean, for us, it's, you know, it's, it's really part of our, let's say, mission statement, right? To empower people to be a step ahead and be people of businesses, right? So it's in the end, it's really linked to financial health um, because that's the way we look into financial health, right? Is to empower people uh, in their, in the, you know, in the way they manage their finances, right? Um, so that, you know, it doesn't get, get more strategic <laughs> than that for, for ING. And how we do it, uh, this is where, you know, we come back to the why partner with fintech and why fintech is important. What we've seen, I think, in the last five to 10 years is that fintechs unbundle financial services, right? So they, they are providing a granularity level that we haven't, we didn't see before, where people will be used to have, you know, big blocks of, Software, say, okay, this is the you know the big value corporation. Actually, fintechs provide that very very specific granular service that that uh, that can be very uh, useful for our clients and for ING. So it's not always the best answer, but it's definitely part of the solution, right? Uh, so for us, we we always want to be part of that, and we want to make sure that we have the right infrastructure, the right mindset to integrate those granular services. Uh, as we need to, right? Uh, as we see the demand, as we see as the best value proposition for our clients and the best client uh, experience, right? So this is the way we want to do it for all our value spaces, what we call value spaces, and financial health is definitely one of the five main priority of, uh, of ING. So um, we, see, we see on the market, uh, as you said, fintechs that are um, working in, in very specific niches, um, which are uh, solving a very specific um, issue for uh, for the customers, and we also see fintechs that are developing 
um, more into this area uh, that was reserved for the banks before um, with multiple multiple um, products in mm -hmm. in their experience so I want to uh, uh, basically challenge you into a debate can we call um, bigger fintech which is um, implementing more and more features a fintech uh, or it's becoming basically a bank? Um, well, I mean, I think there are two answers to that, right? Um, I think the official one would be, you know, you are a bank when you have a banking license. So what you see is that most of the fintechs today do not have a banking license, right? Uh, some of them do, but I would say by, by and large, they don't. Um, and you know, within ING, with the way we define fintech, but again, it's a, it's an internal definition, and everyone can adapt uh, their own definition. Is that we say, okay, we create a fintech, where basically we apply the, the framework I just described at the beginning of our conversation, when it is it is a company which has been created less than ten years ago, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and then obviously you can debate uh, depending on the growth rate, and you can debate, but in the end, whether it's a fintech or not, it's about partnership. When do we want to partner? And sometimes we prefer to partner with a big tech, right? Or a, you know, another large corporate, uh, you know, which could be maybe more seen as a tech fin, you could argue. So what, when is a fintech, when is a tech fin? For, for us, we define a fintech when we need to apply a specific framework for partnership, which is different than I would say the classical framework of partnership when we, I don't know, partner with SAP or with, you know, other large company out there, because we, I mean, we used to partner for a long time. We didn't, we didn't have to wait for FinTech to arrive to, to start partnering. But what we realized that this new type of younger, smaller companies need a specific way of partnering. And that's how we, when we look into a company, we say, okay, from a, state, from a partnership standpoint, if the partnership, if that specific partnership applies, we create a FinTech, otherwise we create a partner. So now whether they are back or not, it's, you know, I would say if they have a banking license and they want to provide the wide range of banking services, of course they are bank. And they could be a neo bank or a newer bank. At ING, you know, in many countries we are a neo bank. <laughs> yeah. So we are depending on the countries, and I think in Romania, you know, we we we, we pride ourselves to be a disruptive bank and neo bank. It's also true in Asia, and it's also true what we call the challenger countries, where we are really a challenger. And they say historically in some other uh, other countries, we are more an incumbent, you could say, you know, in Holland, in Belgium. Uh, so I think that's why we are well positioned because we, we play different roles depending on uh, the countries we operate. So going um, a bit to, to next year's, it was a complicated year, uh, to, um, 2020. So what are the key strategic fields that you are looking into um, for development in the next few years? Yes, I was a bit alluding to a couple of minutes ago. So when we look into our strategy within innovation, we decided to focus on five specific what we call value spaces. Um, and that's going to be where we're going to focus our efforts, our proactive effort in terms of strategic thinking, partnering, developing new ideas uh, in the labs or, or, or outside. Um, uh, but also where we want to be a driving force within the uh, within IAG, right? Um, so financial health, I was just mentioning, is definitely uh, definitely one. Housing is also a very important one because it's, it drives a large part of our retail revenue and that's a very interesting space to to be. Trade is also very important to us. It's a global, you know, it, it's a very important value space for ING. Disrupt lending, so obviously lending as a bank is always a very important thing uh, to do, but we see a lot of opportunity to completely disrupt the way we do lending, both for our retail customers, as well as for SME, as well as for our wealth making banking, uh, banking clients. Um, safe and compliance is obviously also very, very important to make sure we we provide and we keep on earning that trust that our clients are put into, uh, into ING. But also there, there are many interesting propositions that we can bring to the market uh, and to turn, uh, let's say, this into a business opportunity, right? So those are, let's say, the five specific value spaces in which for the months to come and years to come, we really want to uh, to have a specific focus. So because I mentioned about 2020 and it being a very weird 
and special year. Um, how did it change the way um, you have scouted for uh, for solutions? I will not call them fintechs anymore right now in, in the conversation. Solutions for um, the issues that arise um, during this year. What it changed for you? I think it changed a lot. So on one hand, in overall, and I think it's true for everyone, it only accelerated the need to digitization, right? So I think overall, and we've seen a surge in the uh, in mobile uh, transactions and and, and 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 mobile becoming you know the, by far the primary channel so i would say digital mobile acceleration of digitization is just now more than ever a reality right and it's only going to to accelerate so what we've seen is that so that's one um, so the need to even go faster uh, is clearly there and how to go faster Partnering is one way of going faster to the market, right? So we see an even more demand of partnering with, let's say, fintechs or uh, or digital solutions, if you will. So I would say the demand toward our team of finding the right partners from IGBS unit has increased massively. Uh, second, obviously, our clients also suffering a lot from this situation. So we are we need and uh, we want to be there for them uh, in many ways. You know, giving uh, some payment holidays, but also thinking along, right? Um, so there, uh, uh, some of our partners are actually fintechs who are also suffering from that in terms of funding, uh, in terms of having you know, difficulty to face this situation. So we also here with them to see funding wise how we can you know, help them when it makes sense. So also via our ING Ventures uh, Fund. So how do we make sure that we help the companies in which we have invested in our portfolio? Um, and I think, uh, yeah, so. And the third way is that the way we scout, you know, now, I, you know, I am in Romania today and in five minutes I might be in Asia and in 50 minutes I can be in the US. So the way we scout is also easier in a sense because, you know, all the uh, all the great events are free digital. People can find themselves everywhere. So the, the, the marketplace is fully global. So it's much easier to uh, get into contact of anyone. Uh, but it also makes the choice more complicated, right? Because then you get exposed to so many possibilities. So it's about focus. It's about having clear upfront criteria, as we discussed upfront, to make sure that you really fo you know, focus your time and energy and money on basically something that makes sense jointly. Uh, and that's both a challenge and opportunity in these COVID times. Yeah. Olivier, thank you very much for, for the details and for for um, this journey into how um, you look for, for innovation inside and outside the organization. You're welcome, Vlad. Thank you very much. And thank you for everyone who listened or watched the Curious Lion podcast. Today we talked about how banks and fintechs can work together in the end for our good, for the customer's good, for the good of the businesses. Uh, my name is Vlad Andreescu and have a safe and good day.